Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm so very happy to be here with you today. Uh, I'm grateful to the people uh, of the United Arab Emirates for their warm welcome, and I'm especially grateful to His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum for inviting me uh, to participate in this year's World Government Summit. For more than 60 years, the World Bank Group has been working with governments in developing countries to reduce poverty and promote human dignity. We're a proud supporter of this event because good governance is the foundation for all development. Delivering quality public services and creating conditions that encourage businesses to create jobs are fundamental to building opportunity and prosperity for all. The focus of this year's conference, Shaping Future Governments, comes at a pivotal moment in modern history. Last year, for the first time, the rate of extreme poverty was projected to fall below 10%. This is stunning progress. It means today that there are 1 billion fewer people living in extreme poverty than just 15 years ago. But more than 700 million people are still living less on the, than, the, than around $2 a day. Our research and experience tells us that three things have been critical to reducing poverty and boosting shared prosperity. Inclusive economic growth, investments in people's health and education, and ensuring people against risks that can plunge them back into poverty. Risks like unemployment, illness, climate change, and pandemics. Shaping future governments so that they deliver on these responsibilities is our shared responsibility and essential to achieving the twin goals of the World Bank Group, which is to end extreme poverty by 2030 and to boost shared prosperity. The global landscape, unfortunately, suggests that reaching these objectives won't be easy. Economic growth, which is the most powerful poverty reduction force that the world has ever known, is slowing globally. Many emerging markets are suffering sharp reductions in growth because of declining demand from China and lower commodity prices. Warmer temperatures, potentially linked to climate change, made 2015 the hottest year in history. And the most powerful El Nino on record is affecting the lives and livelihoods of billions across the globe. Many parts of the world are becoming more fragile making quality leadership and good governance ever more important. The Middle East and North Africa in particular have been deeply affected by these changes. Lower oil prices are forcing governments across the region to reevaluate policies that have been in place for decades. Economies dominated by large firms are not producing enough jobs. And this is true for countries that both export and import oil. Furthermore, Economies dominated by fossil fuels are currently not earning enough oil revenue to support large public sector expenditures and fuel subsidies. Throughout the region, many of the most highly centralized bureaucracies have not delivered the quality health and education services needed to enable young people to compete in the globalized marketplace. The net result is a long period that discouraged innovation and entrepreneurship. This decline in economic prospects is causing increasing fragility in a region that has already experienced too much instability. Conflicts have now forcibly displaced 15 million people in the Middle East and North Africa, contributing to the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. Fresh water and fertile farmland are becoming scarcer, creating more potential flashpoints. The human development consequences, of course, are very worrisome. Worry. Violent extremists are using these challenging circumstances to rally recruits to their cause with global implications. Deadly attacks in West and East Africa, North America, South and East Asia, and Europe show that all of us have a stake in shaping future governments that are capable of tackling these challenges. For people who feel excluded or aggrieved by society, the feelings of anger and frustration can be overwhelming. When you studied hard and can't find a job, or discovered that your education did not help you develop the skills to get a good job, the personal disappointment can be profound. These circumstances give people powerful motivations to challenge what they see as the source 
of their troubles. Five years ago, in, in 2011, uh, Mohamed Bouazizi, a 26-year-old Tunisian vegetable seller and breadwinner for his family of eight, lit himself on fire to protest treatment he'd received at the hands of his government. Bouazizi's act was essentially triggered by the absence of good governance in his country. Ten days after his death, public protests brought down Tunisia's government. This anger exploded at a time when the national economy was growing. But opinion polls prior to the protest showed that Despite Tunisians' awareness of their country's increasing prosperity, more than 80% considered themselves to be struggling or suffering. Many indicated that their unhappiness was rooted in low-quality public services and infrastructure and a government that made their livelihoods difficult. Poor governance had stretched the country's social fabric beyond repair. Governments that operate in opaque, exclusive, and unaccountable ways or fail to empower local authorities often plant the seeds of discontent. When governments don't allow the public to participate in decisions, they breed suspicion. When governments make decisions on the basis of favoritism, social or ethnic divisions, discrimination or corruption, citizens become deeply aggrieved. The demands for good governance, in fact, are not a recent phenomenon. The demands are rooted in the traditions and history of many cultures, including in the Arab and Islamic world. The scholar Imam Muslim recounted words said by the prophet, and I quote, one whom I appoint to a public office must render account on everything, big and small. The Arab philosopher Ibn Khaldun wrote in his opus, the Mukhattima, that the social compact between the individual and tribes was a sacred bond based on mutual accountability, protection, and proper and reliable delivery of such basic services as security and justice. Ibn Khaldun said, the worst kind of state is a tyranny wherein government usurps property rights and rules with injustice against the rights of its people. So what's the best way forward? We believe is the, the an, that the answer is what we're calling inclusive governance. At the core of inclusive governance, is a social compact between government officials and their citizens that is based on three principles. First, governments must be transparent in their actions and fully engaged with citizens. Second, governments must invest in their people to give them opportunity to reach their full potential. And third, governments must create business environments that encourage innovation, competition, and private sector investment, which will, in turn, create jobs and increase economic growth. A story from Brazil illustrates the benefits of governments being held accountable for their actions. The World Bank Group helped the government build a program called Bolsa Familia. Uh, this is a targeted conditional cash transfer program that promotes opportunity for the poorest by providing money to needy families who keep their children in school and ensure that they receive vaccinations and regular health checkups. The program has helped one of the most unequal countries in the world reduce income inequality, which is a powerful driver of social instability. Bolsa Familia's success is due in part to accountability through its structures, a single register, eliminating the layers of bureaucracy and making the system transparent. The outcomes from this program have been remarkable. Studies show that the program funds help parents buy food, clothing, and school supplies for their children. Since 2003, Bolsa Familia has been responsible for up to 21% of the country's decline in inequality, and the cost is only 0.6% of GDP. Here in Dubai, input from communities and parents has helped the Knowledge and Human Development Authority improve education quality. Today, more than half of the Emirates students are in good or outstanding schools, compared to 30% as recently as 2010 and student achievement has steadily improved over the last five years. Your Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, your invitation last week to the UAE's universities, which you tweeted to identify a minister under age 25 to represent youth and quote, give them a voice and role in governing the nation is among the most inspiring gestures in governance of this still new year.
Community engagement in Brazil and the UAE has helped their governments promote investment in people, a second important element of inclusive governance. We know that investing in people, especially in their health and education, is critical to promoting opportunity and prosperity. Research has shown that education helps people escape poverty at very high rates, starting at the earliest ages. Globally, earnings increase an average of 10% for every year of education for employed workers. Educated women and girls can be particularly effective agents of social and economic progress, both for society and their children. Educated mothers earn higher wages and invest more in their children's health and education. In Pakistan, children whose mothers have even a single year of education spend an extra hour studying at home and achieve higher test scores. Governments that invest in people's health and education also create a powerful counter-narrative to violent extremism. Instead of sowing seeds of discontent, these governments promote opportunity. And that opportunity, if coupled with an improving business environment, can lead to more job creation. Governments must ensure that the business environment helps spark innovation, entrepreneurship, and competitiveness. One example is China. China has produced a remarkable record of economic growth and job creation over the last 15 years, with a vast majority of those jobs created by the private sector. In the last five years, up to the end of 2015, China created, in five years, 64 million jobs. When governments do not promote a fair and competitive business environment, when they limit opportunities by favoring allies, they foster a form of crony capitalism that can lead to instability and chaos. Experience shows us that governments can safeguard the fairness and integrity of their business climates by using special initiatives that reduce regulatory costs for the private sector. Under Denmark's program called the Burden Hunters Project, Officials work directly with companies to simplify rules that the business community perceives as most burdensome. This cooperative approach helped Denmark rank first in Europe and fifth in the world on the ease of doing business in the World Bank's Doing Business report this past year. These are just a few examples. Uh, no doubt you will hear about many more innovations in governance uh, over the course of this conference. For the Middle East and North Africa, for all regions in the world, the path to stability and prosperity is through inclusive governance, actions that foster individual opportunity through quality public services and an open and competitive business climate, much like we see right here in the UAE. Tunisia also shows that this is possible. After the country's revolution, government adopted laws and policies that made its budget decision-making more transparent. The public now has the right to official government information simplified and yet detailed data on state revenue and expenditure, treasury funds, and public administrative entities can be accessed by anyone online. In 2013, when assassinations and social unrest threatened to undo these and other advances, the Tunisian National Dialogue Quartet, a coalition of trade unions and legal and human rights organizations, used its moral authority to bring together citizens, political parties, and authorities in peaceful dialogue. While this process still has some way to go, this dialogue has started to bring accountability and government engagement with citizens to the constitution building process, helping develop consensus on a range of issues across political and religious divides. It also reduced violence and earned the quartet, of course, the 2015 Nobel Peace Prize. Now is the time for even greater ambition for the Middle East and North Africa. Last week in London, we committed to using innovative financial tools to provide new support to Jordan and Lebanon, Syria's neighbors who've been shouldering so much of the burden in hosting Syrian refugees. First, our board of directors is working with our management on an, on an, on an exceptional measure, this is, this is very rare, to provide $200 million in direct concessional financing to create jobs and increase access to education in Lebanon and Jordan. Second, with assistance from the UN and the Islamic Development Bank, we're seeking donors who will provide $1 billion in grants that we will then leverage to supply three to $4 billion in concessional financing to help fund public service delivery and other needs. We are committed. 
These new financing initiatives, combined with our existing programs, are expected to total $20 billion in the next five years, which is roughly three times what we invested in the last five years. We must act much more quickly in response to humanitarian crisis because we know that a refugee can remain a refugee for years, even decades. We must find ways to bring knowledge from development organizations such as ours to improve the life, lives of refugees soon after they arrive in a host country, not years later. Indeed, I believe we all must respond to what one of my heroes, Martin Luther King Jr., called the fierce urgency of the now. He wrote, and I quote, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. I also believe that we must move urgently, not just in response to humanitarian crises, but also to prevent these crises from happening in the first place. In this region, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, that means building good governance. Another influential figure for me is the Palestinian intellectual and writer Edward Said. His book, Orientalism, which is largely about how Westerners perceive and, and frankly, misperceive uh, the East, uh, in, in, including the, uh, the, the Arab world, the Middle East, and East Asia, uh, had a very profound effect on my thinking. He also focused on the power of good governance. He once wrote, and I quote, power after all is not just military strength. It is the social power that comes from democracy, the cultural power that comes from freedom of expression and research, the personal power that entitles every Arab citizen to feel that he or she is in fact a citizen and not just a sheep in some great shepherd's flock. This is the moment for all enlightened leaders in the region and around the world to act and to build inclusive governance. It means that leaders must be transparent in their actions and engage with people so that, as Said said, they feel that they are in fact citizens. It means leaders must invest in their people and it means that they must create business environments that encourage private sector investment. The greatest strength of the Middle East and North Africa is its people, especially its young people. If leaders invest in young people's education and health, if they give youth opportunities by diversifying their economies and sparking the dynamism of the private sector, the future of this region will become far brighter. With good governance, there will be greater opportunity and prosperity for all. One last note that I'd like to make directly to uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. During uh, this, my first visit to the UAE, I have been so deeply impressed by what you and the other leaders here have accomplished. If the rest of the region can commit to the kind of good governance that has built the modern and dynamic UAE, the prospects for peace and prosperity would improve enormously. I pledge that we at the World Bank Group will continue to learn from you and share your successes here with other countries around the world. I also pledge that we will stand by your side and offer our assistance as you continue to accomplish things that we may not be able to imagine, but that I'm sure you, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, are already planning. Thank you very much. Thank you.